Welcome to Rogue Media Network. You have a vision, and we can help you broadcast it. With over 150 podcasts distributed locally, nationally, and internationally, we pride ourselves in delivering high-quality professional content that's filled with humor, information, and entertainment. Are you an avid podcast listener? Discover relatable and reliable shows that cater to a plethora of tastes and interests. From enlightening discussions to lighthearted banter, there's something for everyone. And here's the best part. You can start your own show with Rogue Media Network. We specialize in providing a platform to amplify diverse voices and perspectives, making sure everyone gets a chance to be heard. So why wait? Tune into our podcast and explore a world of ideas and stories, or step up and let the world hear yours. Call us today at 254-300-7982, visit us at roguemedianetwork.com, or send us an email at hello at roguemedianetwork.com. Join the podcast revolution with Rogue Media Network today. Hey, it's Storyworthy. Today on the show, SNL alum Gary Kroger talks about hiding under the bed. They forgot something. They're just coming back. She's going to change her shoes or whatever, whatever, whatever. Where do I go? Where do I go? And I thought, I'll go into the closet. No, that's where she'll change the clothes. And so in a moment of panic, as I hear the door open, I slide under the bed. Then the light goes on in the bedroom. I can smell candles being lit. I see clothes falling to the floor, right? Right. They decided to stay home and fuck. Today on the show, former SNL cast member Gary Kroger talks about hiding under the bed. And oh boy, this is a good one. Stay close. Hey, it's Gary Kroger and you're listening to Story Worthy. Welcome to Storyworthy. My name is Christine Blackburn, and I'm coming to you from Los Angeles, California. Whether you're a longtime fan of the show of almost 13 years, or you're a brand new listener, welcome to Storyworthy. Now, I hope you guys had a chance to listen to Lindsay Glazer last week. Comedian Lindsay Glazer had a story. <laughs> okay, uh, here, okay, she's a lawyer. She's working in the DA's office for Harry Connick Sr. in New Orleans. And then she gets arrested on Mardi Gras for having sex in a car, which so far you're thinking, well, that makes sense. It's Mardi Gras. You know, this is what we do. But it wasn't her car. (laughs) So go back, you guys. Listen to the very funny Lindsay Glazer talking about her Mardi Gras arrest. It's just hilarious. But not today. Stay with me now because today I'm here with another very interesting person. He's a writer and an actor. And his name is Gary Kroger, and he brings forth the topic, hiding under the bed. And I just know that when you're hiding under the bed, okay, you're either a child playing hide-and-go-seek, or you're an adult doing something you're not supposed to be doing. (laughs) Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I'm sure it's one or the other, um, but I'm anxious to hear your story. But meantime, hi, Gary. How are you? Hi, Christine. I'm I'm very well. You know, it, it's funny that we're talking about this story because I don't tell people this story. So here now, potentially thousands of people hear a story <laughs> that I've really kept a secret except for <laughs> close friends. That's awesome. That's so great. And boy, oh boy, Gary, you live in Iowa. Is that right? I, I do. Yeah. You're the one. I I, You're the one. I, Well, no, don't blame me for what's happening in Iowa politically. I'm the one trying to change what's happening here. I know you are. And you have gotten very involved in politics. And I'm impressed by that. You have a a really good blog that I've read a lot of the a lot of the posts. It's called Gary Has Issues. Gary Has Issues dot com. Most recently, you talked about Polly Shore and how. You know, during the Oscars, he really took it on the cuff, the whole joke about Encino Man and all that. And I know Polly. I've had him on my show before. And, um, yeah, that he's an interesting man. And the way you talk about him is you give him a lot of reference. I mean, you're not you're not making him out as the joke. You're telling everybody that he's actually important for what he did when he did it. Christine, I was in the business for 30 years. Yeah. I, you know, I've been out of it for a while now. I act in community theater or any time an independent film comes along and they want, you know, the old janitor. I'm happy to play that role. <laughs> but I, I left the business, but I've never enjoyed. I didn't like then and I don't like now the fact that we're making artists competitive. Mm. And I don't like criticizing a career. 
any career because I know how hard it is. Yeah. I know you put your heart and your soul. You are your product yeah. as well as your own manager in a sense. Yeah. And for anybody to say, oh, you didn't make it well enough or others around you did better. And I've had personal experience, you know, yeah. uh, in being the butt of some jokes. Sure. And, and it didn't hurt my feeling. My life is wonderful. But I just don't think it's fair game to put a person's success at the punchline. I totally I just don't. agree. I totally agree. And it's so hard sometimes for actors and actresses because it seems like we only judge their body of work from what they did last. And we don't give them credit for how long that took to produce and to make and how long they thought yes. about it. And it's like, OK, moving on. Now, what are you doing? Now, what are you doing? Now, what are you doing? And when you think of Polly Shore's career specifically, he had a hell of Absolutely. a run. Absolutely. Holy He cow. had a hell of a run. He was at the top of the comedy game sure. for a good five or six years. Sure, sure. And then as the business does, what he was doing dried up. Maybe his audience grew up for whatever reason, but he got there. Yeah. And then he you what you do in the business is you find anything to perpetuate yourself, to rekindle that spark. And he started making fun of himself. The Paulie Shore is dead, I thought was funny. Yeah. But he was saying, hey, look, I died to get interest in his old movies again. Clever, but at the same time, it's a little too self-deprecating for me. Yeah. I just don't like to see careers made fun of. Well, even if he made fun of it himself. Yeah, he's entitled to and and better him than someone else. But it Pauly Shore has for a while. Look, I'm on the periphery of the of the com comedy business. All my friends are comedians. I've done stand up. Um Pauly Shore has kind of become a, a punchline like, well, you could go the way of Pauly Shore. And then when I saw, you know, the Oscars and, of course, his two co-stars receiving Oscars, From Man. I got yeah. the premise of the joke. Yeah. But it just wasn't worth that laugh for the potential, you know, sorrow that it brings a human being. Yeah. I think that's very you compassionate. Know? No, I think that's all very compassionate of you. And um Especially, it's just so hard in the comedy world. Oh, my oh, gosh. Heavens, yes. You just have to kind of like stay in your lane and do your best and hope for the best and just live your life in that you're doing what you can, when you can, the best you can. And, you know, it's well, random. You know, it's subjective. It's Of course it's it subjective. is. subjective. Here was my criteria as a performer. You know, I did Saturday Night Live. I, I did lots and lots of pilots and every pilot you hope becomes the next Seinfeld, right. but rarely does it. But you get measured by how well known you are, mm -hmm. your last success. My goal, Christine, ever for as long as I was in the business was not to be famous. That's a byproduct. Yeah. It was to work. Yeah. It was just to work. I wanted my kid to get braces if he needed them. I wanted to buy a house. Sure. I just wanted to go to work. And I used to say to my agent, anything but porn. But let's read the script first. <laughs> You know, you know, I, there might be a good pool boy I role. Know, I hear it, what no, you're saying. But, I used to say that. No, I used to always say that, too. No porn, no porn. And I've never done porn, but I have dubbed it. <laughs> <laughs> well, because that's even better. The French porn. Yeah, I dubbed it into English. So I had a Moans little bit of work. Are, is there is there a translation for moaning? Well, of course. No. Now here's what. See, that's Wait, very uh, interesting. Uh, you should uh, say. Uh, no, no, Gary. This is so interesting. You should say this. I had to go down to the Larry Flint Building on Wilshire, and dub this porn. Now, exactly. I did not have to say the oohs and the ahs because that is in uh -huh. all languages. But I did have to say things like, "Gary, I told you my cousin doesn't have anywhere to stay, and she's coming over tonight." So I had, right. and then okay. I had to say. So it's real ADR. You're looping. I this. was looping. Everything was very, very much like that, right? And I'm sitting across from this kid who's doing the sound, and he's got his his headsets on. My headsets are on. The kid's only like 20, and I'm sitting there. And then a scene comes on, and I <laughs> I have to the, say the, the memory recall is say, fascinating. Turn me over and fuck me in the ass. That's what I have to say. Well, of course, well, of course so you did. <laughs> then the guy's like, um, "Could you just try to do that with like um, a little more emotion, please?" <laughs> <laughs> he was embarrassed. I was embarrassed. But no, I know what you're saying. You do whatever you have to do in this industry. You take your chances and, you know, just to propel yourself forward to do what you do best. I mean, some people yes. I, I know 
I've had an office job and it was just a disaster. It was almost like I was having a panic attack every day. Like I, I couldn't be there, you know? So yeah, you, you, you put your talents where you put your talents and where you fall, fall in line and everybody needs yes. entertainers. You know, you got the, the hunters, the gatherers, and then the people that draw the pictures on the wall. That's the one I do. That's perfect. Yeah. And, and I got to tell you, Christine, that is very lucid. It is very wise. It is very compassionate. But my takeaway is turn me over and fuck me in the ass. <laughs> That is what I'm going to tell my wife about oh my later, <laughs> that all the wisdom and perspective that you gave. So it was experienced and mature. You are but turn me so over bad. And fuck me in the ass. You are so bad. Now, you have, no, as well as being on Saturday Night Live with Julia Louise Dreyfus and just yes, some tremendous was, I talents. think she was given the Medal of Freedom or something oh, recently. I mean, it's unbelievable. When you watch her old sketches, she is if not more beautiful today, as beautiful as she was 30 years ago. She's oh, she's more beautiful today. Gorgeous. Uh, really? No, yeah. she's a freak of nature. Yeah. And I can tell you, Christine, I was in college at Northwestern, and there's a comedy show, you know, uh, Steve, I mean, not Steve Carell, but um, um, Steve uh, Colbert yeah. did the show. It's called The Meow Show. Yeah. It's an improv comedy sketch show. And lots of, lots of name, name, next. And there was this young freshman who did... It in, I don't know, 1979, 1980. And we all just went, we in the yeah, college yeah, comedy community sure. who thought we were great, went, who is this? I had never seen anybody just magnetically capture a stage with these characters the way Julia did. So I used to position myself in the library during study halls and things just so that I could meet her. Aww. And then it turned out we became great friends. And Brad Hall, her future husband, and I were great friends. You and, met her before and so he many did, others. right? I did meet her before Brad <laughs> did. Um, and we were ter with terrific friends. But then we started doing comedy together in Chicago and outside of Northwestern University that caught the eye of Second City. And it just mushroomed into Saturday Night Live. But my point of my story is I knew Julia had something special from the beginning. Now, I don't think Saturday Night Live really used her very well, didn't use me very well, didn't use Brad very well. But there's still something about her and it's, I can't even put it into words. It's just she's so authentic behind her eyes. She she never misses a beat. Yeah. Never misses a joke in the most realistic manifestation. Yeah, she's always never right there. You never think like she's right not there. you yeah, you would never watch her in anything, whether it was Veep or, you know, the old adventures of New Christine, all of her stuff. She's always present. She never looks always. like she's just standing by. She is the person every single moment. Forty years ago, I, I can't put dates. I don't I don't remember anything. I remember <laughs> yesterday. But many, many years ago, it would be decades now, I auditioned for Chris Guest and I did a small role in a film called The Big Picture. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he came and said, hey, guess who auditioned for the lead? And he said, I said, who? And he said, Julia came in. He brought her in because of our connection. At, at, and I said, how'd she do? And he went, not very good. What? Really kind of a bad audition. And I remember thinking, oh, that's too bad. Because I was working a lot at the time and Julia wasn't yet. And I remember thinking, oh, poor Julia. She's so talented. Maybe no one's ever going to discover her. <laughs> <laughs> cut to Seinfeld, cut to everything. Wait, who got that? Cut was that beep. then Catherine, who got, Catherine um, Ross got it? Or wait, what's her name? I'm pretty sure it was the role from Fast Times at Ridgemont yeah. High, the, the blonde. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Oh, she's well known. It's, it's such a shame that That's I'm not. Okay. She deserves yeah, to be yeah, yeah. recognized. Sure, 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 but, but it's okay. It was that yeah. role of the weird artist. Sure, sure, sure. Interesting, type. interesting. How about when you guys, I mean, I don't have to remind you, but when you and Julia Louise Dreyfus performed as Donnie and Marie Osmond on the Christmas <laughs> yeah. special, it was called Blue Christmas. That was yeah. so funny because you're pretending that you're Donnie and Marie, which obviously is brother and sister. <laughs> And then at the end, you and, start making out. I'll be so blue Christmas without you. Well, it seemed like such an obvious joke to play on Donnie and Marie. It's like this wholesome, yeah. you know, Mormon right. couple of brother and sister getting closer and closer. And then they start to slowly peck at each other and then make out. I think Eddie Murphy ad lived Donnie and Marie. Is that what's going Hawaiian is all about or something like that? Um, but typical of Saturday Night Live. 
It's a one joke premise. Yeah. I mean, it's That's just okay. a one That's joke okay. premise. Yeah. But it got a huge laugh. So what do we do the next week? Another Donnie and Marie special. And then the St. Patty's Day special, and she's pregnant. Oh, my God. So we just kept at, yeah. Oh, my we, God. You get a laugh, so and you replicate funny. it as best you can. So darn funny. And you were on Saturday Night Live for three years? It yeah. was three years, and that was the years that Lauren Michael was not associated with the show. Correct. What was his deal at that point? He said, I, I'm just taking a break, or what What was that deal? I think he felt that, you know, the, the, the first five years were epic, yeah. right? Epic. Nothing had been done. Well, things had been done like it, but not no. that way. And it didn't, they found a demographic that was just invaluable, yeah. you know, college yeah. students for the most part. And I think he looked at that five-year cycle when the A cast yeah. left, Belushi and sure. Aykroyd were gone. It's like, you know what? It ran its course. That's my take on it. And then, but the show was a cash cow. So Gene Dumanian came in, but that wasn't a good year. So Dick Ebersol, who was part of the original development yeah. from NBC with Lauren, came in to manage the show. He found Eddie Murphy. He found Joe Piscopo. They found a cast and they got some momentum. Then they saw me, Brad, Julia, and Paul Barras doing comedy next door to Second City in Chicago, and literally on a Saturday night, and this is the great rags to riches story, I'm a college kid, just graduated, and I'm hoping to put gas in my car. I'm hoping to take my girl to the picture show for a buck fifty. You know, I mean, that's my life, a little church house. Right, right. And they, they said, hey, we saw the show. We didn't know who they were. We'd heard that Tim Kazarinski had been there the week before. And they said, will you come to our hotel tomorrow? So we go to the hotel, the Hilton Hotel. And I said, can you be in New York in two weeks? We'd like you to be the new cast of Saturday Night Live. Now, I remember driving down Vin uh, uh, Lakeshore Drive with Julia, screaming, oh. singing. It was like having won the lottery. Oh. Literally having won the lottery. But, Christine, that that was, and I don't, I'm not looking for violins here. That was the best of it there. Yeah. I loved the show. I loved living in New York. I loved everybody yeah. there. It was a difficult show to do. People cried every week. It wasn't easy. But the most exhilarating was the anticipation, the moment yeah. of being yeah. hired. I, I have a story like that when I got hired on a TV show for two years as well. You know, driving back, it was in Santa Monica, the last audition, and I'm coming through Westwood. And I call my brother, and it was just like... Like you said, it was so exciting. But for me, it was more like I can breathe for just a second and not worry about money. You know, that was a big part yeah. of it, right? A right. big part. And as young actors, we're we're shooting in the dark. We don't know if we're good fisher right. people right. or not. We don't know if we're going to catch anything. It was a validation that, oh, I'm not full of yeah. shit. Maybe I do have something that people yeah, recognize. Yeah, the best part of that, getting a job is getting the job. And then the work starts. Yes, and cashing the check. Yeah, now back in the 80s when cocaine was very popular, it was kind of like that. The best part of doing cocaine was going to get it. Because once you start doing it, it was all over. It was no good anymore. It was the going oh, to God. get it. Never, never go back to those days. Never, oh, God. Never. I know. I hear you. Hey, listen, you've also had a lot of success as a host on television game shows. And I'm a big fan of game shows. So you did revivals of the Newlywed Game and Beat the Clock. Yeah. And then you were the announcer for Card Sharks and Press Card Your Sharks, Luck. Card uh, Sharks, Press Your Luck. Press well, your here's luck. the thing. This goes back to what I said earlier, because everybody said, oh, Kroger, you're going to kill you kill your career. And I go, well, you know what? I'm not working enough. I'm not working enough. I've got a son. I've got a baby. Um, I, I need to work. And they want me. They want me to do yeah. host these shows. You have a wonderful voice and a great presence. Why not? Well, I loved it. Yeah. My job, you know, you work, you do six or seven shows a day, three days in a row. Those a are work. tough three days. Big work, yeah. But you get paid for them. And my job was to play games with nice people and give them cash and prizes. That, yeah. That's a good job. That's a very good job. And then I'd have job. a long weekend to spend that money or take my family out to Hawaii yeah. or whatever. Yeah. I loved that cycle of life. And when you were doing those game shows, were you aware of a lot of like, I don't know if it's FTC people or who are the people that are controlling that this is a fair game? Who are those yes. people? Yes. Oh, you know what? It's been so many years. They, yeah, that's a huge presence. Is it the FCC standards FCC. and practices maybe yeah. or something like that? Oh, no, they watch 
everything to make sure that no possible lawsuit or any advantage was given to the blue couple over the yeah. red couple yeah. or that they saw something in the box first. And they it weren't was, looking at you so much because you're the one hosting. You're just saying what's in the teleprompter. Right. But they're sitting what on the table, like cl- close right on stage with the uh, with the producers and whoever. And they're ready yeah. to just kind of bring down the hammer to say, wait a minute. Yeah. And it didn't happen often, but it would happen if there was a delay for some technical reason, it might give a couple more time to think about an answer than another. So you'd have to throw out the question. You'd have to go back and and redo the whole thing. I used to comment, though, if other things ran with such efficiency and (laughs) that even government, perhaps oversight and things like that, perhaps we wouldn't have all of the issues that we have. Oh, my gosh. I'll tell you what. People working on game shows, people working on I would imagine on soap operas, anything where it keeps on going, those crew members is a the tightly run machine. Oh, you know, yes. these guys, they know what they're doing and they want to get out on time. And all the people that are there are just the moving parts. You guys, right. not you necessarily as the, as the host, but all the contestants and the audience and everybody. They just have to get those people in their places and then get yeah. through it. But they know what they're doing. They're professionals they and they sure make do. it move quickly. Well, I would say to anybody, going back to Saturday Night Live for a second, anybody that's had the opportunity to be in the audience, either for the rehearsal show or the live show, they are seeing such a well-oiled machine in real time, moving sets to sets, cutting to video, setting up this, changes sometimes in front of the audience because you go from this sketch... And you're the lead in the next one. Sure. And the director it's, it's an calls amazing. you over and says, who has a better joke? That didn't work. Who's, who's got yeah, a better right. joke? There's and all right of this there, happening in real time. That's but the incredible. crew just moving like liquid from set to set. Because they've often worked experience. together, worked together for years. And it's like the DP has their own crew. And, that, you know, these all yeah. these people, you know, it's very much a blue collar job for them. And they're yeah. just getting through their union employees and they just they yep. know what they're doing. So I know what you're saying. So then you out of the blue, it seems in the in the middle of the 2015, 2016, you announced your candidacy for the U.S. Oh, House yeah. of Representatives from Iowa's Correct. first congressional district. So Correct. you're from Iowa. Iowa, you move back to Iowa, you raise your family, and now you want to get involved in the politics of Iowa. Well, you know, it, it it's no mystery, and it became no mystery to me that actors often go into politics because there's two things. First of all, you're used to making speeches. You're used to being in front of people. You're very comfortable improvising. But there's a more crucial thing that I noticed, Christine, and that is What is our job? What is your job as an artist, as an actor, as a comedian? Your job is to look at life, the reality of life with the most intense microscope or telescope, however you want to look at it. But you are looking at the idiosyncrasies, the machinations of how people live with the most critical eye and by critical, I just mean, I mean, objective eye. Yeah. You're trying to make things work. Being in the business, it's a team, it's cooperative, it's collaborative. So those skills are what we need in state houses and in Mm -hmm. Washington that I think are sorely missing. But I found that my skill set was perfect for being a representative of the people. Wow. That's so interesting. Yep. Well, no. And also you're very likable. You can come across. It seems you, well, could, you could you could sway, <laughs> you know, sway people one way or another. But what happens is and I'm not positive, but I would guess that you get caught up in the mires of all of it and realizing that you can't get things done. You get stuck and you're probably thinking like this is never going to be ready to go at midnight on Saturday night or 1130. You know, well, you guys, let's it, we gotta certainly... move things ahead. Let's go. Let's go. And then it's not moving the way you are used to it. Well, you know, the the the, the addendum to my story is I lost. I mean, I lost uh, pretty soundly to a Trumpian uh, Republican. Uh, it, I, I lo- that was the Trump wave. And a lot of Democrats, even at that last minute, working class Democrats, moved over to Trump just saying, OK, b- fresh air. He's, he tells it like it is. They bought that rhetoric, that game of his. Yeah. And, and so there was a big shift. And a lot of my base left me for the election. So I did not win. I do feel to this day, and I'm not planning to run for office again. I think I've done too many talk shows where I say fuck and things like that and laughed at 
fu- turn me over and fuck me in the ass too often. <laughs> it would certainly come up, right, if I ran for office. Right, right. So I have no intention of running yeah. for office. But I believe that if I had, I do believe that I had a unique skill set to go into Des Moines. And originally, I intended for Congress in yeah. Washington yeah. that I could have persuaded people. Because I do. I am a storyteller. Yeah. And I know the the... the Act one, act two, and act three, and how to find the close. And you, ask for the order. And you are from Iowa. I mean, you you, yeah. you are from there. It's interesting that it didn't translate, but I guess it was just that that was the time. Like you said, the Trump thing, people it were coming up. It was the time. So now tell me, can you, and then we're going to get to your story, but can you tell me a little bit about what Iowa is like now in, in 2023? Well, I can't tell you what it's like until I tell you what it was like 20 years ago. When I moved back here, Iowa Supreme Court had just struck down the Defense of Marriage Act. It was progressive. It was saying, no, you cannot dis- you cannot discriminate against uh, gay marriage. Yeah, good. And all sort. And we were paying teachers and we were budgeting schools and Iowa education ranked near the top over the last 20 years. Pro- progressively, that's the wrong word, but things have systematically been destroyed. A conservative wave that I saw firsthand took over Des Moines. We now have a completely uh, conservative um, house and Senate in Des Moines, and they are doubling down on the Second Amendment of gun rights. They're doubling down on restricting transgender freedom. They don't want to give um, lunch to people. Yeah, they don't want kids right. to Right, they, they don't want to feed hungry right. children. And they do it in the name of austerity, the name of more taxes in your pocket, and we'll reward corporations with the money we save. And it's not <sighs> going to work. It never has worked. And I fear for my home state. Oh, I really Gary, do. I'm telling you, man, It when you start talking about real things, it gets so unfunny so fast. <laughs> Yeah, I know. It's just it's not yeah. funny anymore. You know, it's just politics. Uh, no. It's so frustrating. And that must be very hard for you to see. That must be very difficult to see. It is. And and, you know, this isn't my farewell to Iowa, but my wife, uh, my wife works in Chicago, but she there. She's so brilliant that they're going to let her work from here. We're going to fix our house up to sell and probably move to a blue state. Yeah. Just yeah. because I'm you know, I'm in my 60s. I want to go to coffee shops and yeah. and. Talk You're going to be here for 25 more years. You may as well have like some friends yeah, or some right. like-minded people around you. So do you think that this conservative wave will be essentially over in two generations? Or is this never, this is just the way it is. There's always going to be those kinds of people. Is that the deal? Christine, I've got five kids that range from 17 to 24. Uh-huh. And they are bright and they are progressive and they are um, uh, uh, diverse and accepting, conscious, and their friends are. And so as maligned as they are, this generation, oh, they don't want to work. Yeah, they do. But they don't want to work on your terms, Mr. Man. They want to work for a better so life. So maybe this is going to be over life. in a couple of generations. I pray. I pray. I pray. I, it's the only thing yeah. that gives me hope. I have a 16-year-old, and it's the same. It's like then you they're know. friends, and those kids, they're just so flipping bright. They're never going to— I know, you know it. They're so bright. And now that Talented. they've gone through COVID, it's like these kids are much brighter than the current um, administration. I, I, I think I have hope. I'm, I have hope is what I'm saying. I actually have hope. I, I have that hope, too. I don't think we've set the table for them to start with the best advantages, yeah. but you know what? It's their world and we're just Biden time and hopefully they'll take, o- hopefully they'll be interested enough in politics to take over these yeah. Senate and, and House seats. So Gary, you had five kids in seven years. Well, I'm, I'm remarried. Okay. So my, my wife had three, so I have three um, stepkids but were they and all then I little? have two boys. Were they own. all little at the same time? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that must have been fun. Uh, you know, it's I haven't actually come up with an adjective yet for it or any verb to describe what it was. <laughs> it simply was what it was. Yeah. I haven't decided yet. You know, they're, they're still about us, yeah. right? They're still living around us and stuff like that. So we have yet to have the, oh, I miss those kids. I miss those little rugrats. Right, sure. We haven't gotten there yeah, yet. Yeah. We don't, of course, we just love them beyond of course. belief of and course. tears. Yeah, no, it's but, great fun. 
It's great fun. I'm, I'm yeah. really happy I had my child. But, you know, you think about like a messy house or like too much laundry or the dishes. It's just like give in, man. Just give in. It's going to be that way for many years. Just say, screw it. I don't care. Yeah. It's just there's just always going to be dishes. So what? Oh, my, when my wife hears you say that, she's going to go, what have I been telling you? Just let it go. <laughs> they don't do dishes. That's just the it's way it true. is. It's true. Just settle in. I know. My kid, I don't make them do any. I <laughs> mean, a in. couple of little things they might do for me chores-wise. But otherwise, I'm like, you know what? You're leaving the house at 730 in the morning. You're getting back at 5. You already got plenty of stuff going on. You know, uh, don't worry about it. Exactly. Anyway. Hey, listen, um, you also, and then we're going to get to your story on Gary Has Issues. You wrote a really thorough blog about Marjorie Taylor Greene. You know, and then Hmm. there's these people that are just coming out of the woodwork that they don't even have a past. They don't even have credentials. And now they're in places they're spokespeople they're, yeah and it's they're they're, they're icons right uh, of, of the conservative well you know uh, it's 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 carl sagan said it before he died many many years ago that he fears that there will be a revolution of ignorance and people will celebrate ignorance that's where we are marjorie taylor green lauren bobert matt gates they are a donald trump yeah. they are a celebration of what we don't know right. They're a, they're a, 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 a pyramid of fear yeah. that they've created. It's, it's demagoguery 101. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's, 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 um, it's dumbing down everything. It, 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 Carl Sagan said those very words. It is the dumbing down of America yeah. that concerns him the most. And as we take our focus away from education and budgeting yeah. education and giving it to corporations instead who don't need the money, but our teachers do, our schools do, that is the dumbing down of America. Yeah. And we are reaping those results now of <sighs> people who don't understand civics, who don't understand why human, the history of human beings and the necessity for cooperation. Yeah. And for understanding and for expanding. I'm on my pulpit now. No, I hear you. Expanding civil rights. I just said we're moving on and I'm back. I can't help it. I I can't stop talking (laughs) about it. No, it's true. Like right now, the LAUSD um, school district is on strike because they were paying teachers aides, which are the same as teachers, essentially. They're paying them twenty five thousand dollars a year. So people working full time in your kid's classroom are not even making right. minimum wage. Like that is no, so it, unfair. And when you go spend time in schools. And if you schools, don't pay minimum wage. Yeah. And if you don't raise the minimum wage to a livable wage, then what choice do hardworking people have but to be on the dole? Yeah. But to get food stamps. You have to. But to get what the right is calling entitlements. Yeah. Hand me down, you know, there's no like cho- freebies. There's no choice. You have no choice. My kid is in a. 10th grade, but like elementary school seems like yesterday. And I remember the teacher's aides and how hard they worked. I mean, they're working just as hard as everybody else. And they're dealing with hundreds of kids every day. Like that job should pay the most money. (laughs) Yes. And keep this in mind, because I hear that argument. Well, they only work a few months out of the year. Teacher's job is easy. No, they work after school every day. They take the work home every day. They're entitled to go to the play, to the game, to everything. Their weekends. They spend their summer Summers, probably, if not having to take another job to make yeah, to pay sure. the bills, they at least have to study. Yeah. They have to study for a new curriculum. Yeah. These are the hardest. They, they're working 16 hour days. And they're the ones raising the children. <laughs> Your children. Oh, don't don't get me started. But. You have, and I, boy, do I agree I hear with you. you. Man, oh, man. Um, you guys, you have to check out Gary's blog, GaryHasIssues.com. GaryHasIssues.com. It's really good. And we're going to go over your story right now. But before we do, I wanted to remind everybody that my other show, My Life in Three Songs, is going strong. On My Life in Three Songs, I talk to comedians about the three songs in their life that have impacted them. It's not necessarily the comedian's favorite songs, but songs that take them back to a place and time and really paint a picture of how that comedian grew up and where they grew up. So please check out my Life in Three songs over there on Spotify. It's exclusively on Spotify because we listen to the music and I don't steal music. All right, you guys, he's here right now. You've heard him talking, Gary Kroger. Holy cow, what an accomplished person and a well-rounded person you are, not only as an actor and as a writer, but like you said, as a game show host, and then you get involved (laughs) in politics and it's like you really care. And that is so... Unusual. 
<laughs> well, you're, you, well, unfortunately, it might be somewhat unusual. Uh, 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 perhaps I'm an anomaly. But the story that I'm going to tell you will erase all of those oh, notions good. Oh, good. Of, of my credibility. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's true. Are like, you ready? No, but I'm just one more time. Getting one more thing. Getting involved in politics is such a selfless job. You are going to yes. volunteer your ass off. You are going to have to stay late at meetings where people you don't even know are screaming about bullshit, and you have to keep yourself like leveled and and f- fair, yeah. and you have to meet meter your your being. You have to meter yourself because you have to right. stay very at least if you want to be PC, a good one, as it were. You have to be politically correct. Because right. now you're a politician. And that right. just must be, it must really be in your heart to want to do that. Well, it, 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 it is. It was. Again, I'm not going to run again. But I help candidates that I believe in. I write, I'm a speech writer and I, I, I get behind the scenes and fundraisers and coffees and things like that. I, I think it's essential, uh, Christine, and I know you agree, uh, and I hope most listeners agree, It's essential to be involved in politics. You don't have to be the person running the fundraiser or canvassing. You don't have to be, but you have to be conscious. You have to read the paper or however you receive real news. You have to question all the news. You have to look for resources. You got to dig deep. So many people don't do that at all. Because no, they it's why Fox News blew right. up. Is it does thinking right, for half right, right. of America? And they're telling you rather than you getting information and disseminating yourself. Right. Ay, ay, ay. Okay, let's get over to something funny and let's hear the story about hiding <laughs> okay. under the bed, folks. Wherever you are, put your hands together for the very talented Gary Croker. Well, I have to offer up uh, uh, some disclaimers from the at the start of this story because this was thirty years ago. I was a young man, and I've always been, in my view, a good person, a person with a good heart and a good soul. But like lots of young people, you know, I was prone to mistakes and confusion, and you know, relationships were dangerous at times. And I was an actor. I'd had some success. And so we're looking in the early 90s, I think. For, and I had a girlfriend. And she was an actress um, and a model. And uh, she was very difficult. <laughs> she was very difficult. And I'm not saying that in any sexist way. You could probably say that I was complicated and difficult. But we had a very tempestuous, complicated, difficult. I think the word that uh, family counselors use is an hysterical <laughs> relationship of highs and lows. But for me, Christine, I've always had a little bit of a white knight complex where I just feel that I can find broken people and fix them. So here was this swan, this intelligent, charismatic, talented human being. And I just, and I had a TV show and I was just gaga for her. And I had enough going on that she decided to date me. Well, this was a five-year span of, of a, this relationship, and I just got deeper and deeper involved. And when we would have the big fights and she'd throw a drink in my face at, at a bar or what have you, I would go home and go, I guess it's over, and I'd be heartbroken, but we'd get back together. It's one of those relationships, right? Well, I was successful. I had my own house, but I let friends live in it who are coming to L.A. And I rented a little house on Moor Park in the Valley in Studio City for her. But I lived there in this little one bedroom hamlet, this little house. And I, it's going well. And I thought, hey, you know what? Maybe, maybe I need to look at rings and things like that. I mean, I was frightened of what the future could look like with somebody who was so difficult but it's like I know where my heart lies, and I was thinking you about were living that. together. So as we well. sa- we were living together, right? And I had you know my favorite clothes and shoes, and my CDs were there. That's the kind of the way we played music then, or they might have been been cassettes. But anyway, one evening, late afternoon, she said, "Gary, you're going to have to move out." Uh, why? I'm seeing someone else. I met somebody. Well, that's a look, that's a heartbreak for anybody, right? For yeah. anybody. Doesn't matter that I was a little bit emotional and kind of a little bit of a wild person myself. That's heartbreaking, right? And I said, well, who is it? Well, it was just somebody that I met on a job and, and we got really serious really fast. And you need to get, you need to get out of here because he's coming over. We're going to dinner. <laughs> no, like no. 
Yes, I told you. She was an hysterical personality. You, you need to go. And she said, I'll call you tomorrow. Don't come by unannounced. I'll call you and you can come and get your things. And look, I was a, 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 a broken young man. So, I, OK, OK, uh, goodbye. And I get in my car and I drive down the street. Now, here's where the here's the thing that it's a crazy choice that I made. But a lot of people go, yeah, I would have done that, too. I decide I got to see what this guy looks like. Yeah. Right. Who did I lose to? So I, I keep driving around the block until I see the guy get go into the driveway and oh. get out of the car. And he gets out of the car and my God, he's muscular and <laughs> oh, tall shit. and handsome. Shit. And I go, shit, <laughs> shit. And they, he goes in the house. Well, I'm, I'm in a, I'm in an obsessive loop now, right? I'm going to keep driving around. Blah, blah, blah. And I saw them dressed up, backing out to leave. And I go, oh, she said they're going to dinner. So they're going to dinner. And here's, here's where I made a tragic miscalculation. I said, you know what? I'm going to break into the house and I'm going to get my shit Yeah, out of you there. live there too. I'm going to get my stuff out. Because, it, because I lived there and I knew, and she didn't know, I knew that the kitchen window didn't close all the way and I could jimmy it up from the outside and get into the house even with the doors locked. Yeah. So they're gone. It's dark now, and I get into the house, and I'm getting my stuff. I'm getting my CDs, and I'm, I've got my clothes. And I'm thinking, when she calls tomorrow and says, get your stuff, I said, oh, I already got my stuff. And, and this was my thinking. When did you get your stuff? Oh, geez, I was ready to break up with you weeks ago, and I took my stuff out of here. I wanted that power to yeah. say, oh, I was so done with this relationship, right? So I've got my stuff, and headlights start coming up the drive. And I realize that's oh, no. the car they left in. They're coming back. There's no way to get out of the house because that kitchen window is over the driveway. So I'm in the house and a big man is about to come in. I thought, should I just explain what I did? You know, there's, there is some rationality to it. And I said, I'll be explaining that through broken teeth. <laughs> So I'm going, okay, they're, they're just, they forgot something. They're just coming back. She's going to change her shoes or whatever, whatever, whatever. Where do I go? Where do I go? And I thought, I'll go into the closet. No, that's where she'll change the clothes. She has a dog who loves me, so he's just following me around. And so in a moment of panic, as I hear the door open, I slide under the bed. Oh, my God. I slide under the bed. It was a logical choice. It was the only choice that was left that wasn't the closet. And I'm thinking, I'll just be down here. The dog's not freaking out. They'll get their stuff. I'll hear the door close. I'll get out, and it'll be all be over. Well, they're not leaving. And I hear muffled tones and footsteps. And then the light goes on in the bedroom. I can hear, I can smell candles being lit. I see clothes <laughs> from underneath oh the bed. <laughs> I see clothes. <laughs> Falling to the floor, oh right? God. Right. They decided to stay home and fuck. <laughs> oh my God. Right. Right. They said, we're not going out. Let's just, let's just, you know, make this beast happen oh. right now. But here, so, so, Chris, now hear me out. So here I am, heartbroken, 30 years old, heartbroken. I was like, I, I didn't know how I would deal with this in any way, shape, or form. And now I'm hearing her making oh, the same noises, no. calling him the same names, right? And I, every, and I, the, the, the mattress is going, <laughs> <laughs> right Coming in my face, <laughs> right in my face. The dog's nose is trying to get under the bed and go, no, no, no. Oh my God. But, but again, not freaking out, but I hear the whole act oh. of what I thought God. I was going to be oh, doing God. that night. Right. <laughs> and I heard, oh, you're so big. Everything. Oh, no. To just rip my heart out. Well, it doesn't oh. end there. They fall oh, asleep. No. I think about sneaking out, but I've got to get by the dog. I've got to open the door. There's no way. So I just said, I'm just going to wait here. Well, guess what? Eventually, yeah. I fell asleep. I fell sound asleep under two people <laughs> right. under the bed. Now you fall asleep and I woke up. I didn't remember anything. So imagine waking up and there's a mattress, there's box springs over your face. And I go, what the fuck? Oh my God. 
I've been here for like six hours. I fell asleep and I'm still under the bed. So, <laughs> so I waited and I heard them get dressed and have breakfast and, and go oh off to work. God. Right. So after a period of time, I thought, I guess I can slip out. There's always risk involved, you but I can't stay- spend yeah. <laughs> another day there. So I slip out. I go out the front door. And I go around the block where I parked my car. It's seven o'clock the next morning or eight o'clock the next morning. I get in my car. I'm in the same clothes. And I thought, what the fuck did I just do? Un- <laughs> my intention. And of course, I didn't get my CDs. You didn't, or anything you didn't like take that your either, stuff with my you? Clothes. No, I didn't. No, at that point, I just wanted to get out of there. So, uh, so eventually I did make the call and go and get my things. And I met oh. the guy and he was not only handsome, he was oh, really nice. Gross. And yeah, it was, it was oh. a terrible story. Now you, you recover, you recover. She's you know, not the one for you. She kicked she's him out eventually. She's not the one for you. No, that's, she, she was not the one for me. And it, it's very painful for a lot of, for a long time, it's very painful. It was, it was very painful. But then there comes a day when you figure things out and you're happy ag- again and you realize, oh my God, what a great yeah. story. Now, it's not a story that you know, certainly I didn't tell that on the no, campaign no, trail, but- did I? I mean, it's not a story that you share with a lot of people, but I've always thought, and my wife thinks that what a great coming of age yeah. <laughs> movie. Or what an interesting high concept film of how do good people get into situations I don't know. like Did this? Did you see Three's Company? Which, <laughs> I remember that show. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it really right. sounds like well, that. But generally, right? That premise is usually well, a lack yeah. of communication. This was, but you be, know, this was being over under communication the bed and then my, seeing clothes falling off of people. I don't know how you off did the bed. it. But we all go through heartbreaks. All of us. All of us go through some relationship where you just hate the thought of yeah. them being with someone yeah. else for a while. Well, I had had to accept that at five o'clock and two hours later, they're <laughs> fucking over me. There's there's literally a mattress and box spring separating me from my worst oh, nightmare. God. And the night before, you never would have thought, well, tomorrow night I'll be under the bed while my girlfriend no! is. I thought. We finally, we got yeah. our act together. Did she, and it sounds like you kind of left on okay terms. You didn't get mad at her. You just realized this no. is not oh, happening. No, 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 no. There's always, uh, you know, it was complicated because I was making money. Yeah. I loaned her lots of money. And, you know, eventually when, when somebody breaks up with you and they're screwing somebody else, says, hey, you know that money I lent you? It's time for you to pay that back. So yeah. it, it ended very um, yeah, yucky. yucky. Yeah. But, you know, again, this is... 30, 1993, yeah. My, four. Well, it's, it's a you know, long it's interesting. In 1992, my first husband, we, we'd only been married less than a year, and he got another girl pregnant. Not me, <sighs> another girl. And I'm flexible, well, well, Gary, okay? But I'm you, not that flexible, okay? <laughs> Yeah, well, well, somebody can say to you, you know, bend over and let me fuck you in the ass. But that yeah. was a that was but, a whole you know, these different. These things do happen, and I'm, you know, in a way, it's like okay, they well, do. I mean, it was devastating at the time, absolutely devastating. But then you do obviously you move on, and you just chalk it up to well, I, you know, you dodged a bullet essentially. What if you had gotten well, of her course, a ring? and you know what? They're, they're, I mean, that's. Well, exactly. I mean, surely we would yes, be divorced yes. long ago. So, but that was just a painful way to make it happen sooner. But you know, there there is a there is a moral to this, or at least a, a lesson to this. That I'd like to think that anything that we share like this has some yeah. value because we know lots of people. I know kids; they've had kids. Suicide is on the rise. There's all of these things. We watch our kids get so sad and upset. Um, a young man from a high school down the street Ugh. killed himself over yeah. relationship issues. And it happens everywhere. I liked it. It's important to say to people, the sun yeah. comes up again. There will be a morning where the sun comes through the kitchen window and you realize that you feel yeah. okay again. It comes. It happens. You don't know exactly when, but go ahead and experience the pain, the heartache, but don't 
Don't ever end your life thinking that you'll never be happy again. You yeah, will I be. Find, I find that and the better. only thing I can say sometimes to friends or my nieces or anybody that's hurting is just say, this is going to pass. I know you don't I know you don't think that right yeah. now, but it's going to. It's going to pass. So just hang on. Hang on. And just keep yeah. breathing, you know, and keep resetting the clock, you know, one, two, three, four, five, count through it or whatever you have to do to get to the other side, because yeah. it will change and it will be over. Right. It wasn't the last heartache in my life. Sure. I got divorced, you know, and sure. that was painful, too. But I use that kitchen window analogy or, or metaphor in a way, because that's what happened to me is I woke up one morning and I got my coffee and birds were chirping and the light was coming through the window. And I thought, what am I forgetting? Oh. Wow, this is so beautiful. What? Oh yeah, I forgot to be sad. Yeah. I forgot the hurt. That's a nice. There was the moment really of transition. Yeah, it's an epiphany. It's an epiphany, and you realize, like, yeah. okay, wait a minute. Oh yeah, epiphanies are huge in the world. To have those personal epiphanies, like, oh yeah. shit, I can't believe I almost gave away the farm to that asshole or whatever. You know, like, oh right. my right. god, Keep this had exactly. to happen, or I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have met that person. I wouldn't have had these children because I would have blown it that way. So right. yeah, oh, great story. Right. You wouldn't have heard That's that right. new piece of music that you yeah. can't stop playing. I mean, there's all of these things, and you get this rich story. Yeah, that's what story. it's the, the tapestry of our lives. It's the woven fabric. <laughs> yes. But it's true. You well, have to you know have what? some grit in it's you. It's true. You know, you have to have a bit of grit, a bit of like, yes. okay, yeah, I have experienced some things, and here's what's going on, you know? Um, yeah, I hear you. I feel that way a lot in Hollywood because I'm older now, so I'm not like the young kids, but I think to myself, but in ways, I wish I was younger, but in other ways, it's like, nah, I kind of like where I am because... Because I have figured a few things yeah. out. That's yeah. where I am, too. And and I was just talking to friends. We're all middle-aged. And, and they were saying, Kroger, you're, so, you're not as crazy as you used to be when you were hiding under beds <laughs> and things like that. And I said, yeah, because just what you said, Christine, yeah. I figured some things out. I'm, yeah. I'm not Teflon. Nobody is. But I've, I've, I've come to understand that the... the thought that we have as children that life is going to be a fairy tale and that life is going to have a happy ending and all of these great successes isn't yeah. isn't the narrative the narrative is hills and valleys and struggles and and ways to find enrichment from yeah, every and, challenge you, know, you get those and so yeah, i look at that big now highs, and it, it gives you get me the big peace. highs but with that you have to have some lows i mean that's that's the whole deal yeah if it was all high, it's like being on drugs. You need and a higher high and a higher high. Right. I know what smarter than that like. because you realize, like, look, this is reality. You know, you got to be an adult sooner yeah. or later. Yeah. You can't just escape into drugs because yeah. then you're just, it's so selfish. It's too, um, yeah, it's it's too narcissistic right. to think that you're the only one that needs to feel yeah. good at every second. It is. It is narcissistic. Yeah, That's like, exactly. Like, welcome to the like, world, it, man. It's not, it ain't that easy. You know, and now you learned. Well, we watch our – all kids go through a, a selfishness. You have to be yeah. selfish when you're little. But I, I've said to my kids or one or two of them at various times, hey, kid, it ain't all about you. I know it seems that way. I know it seems like you're the center of the universe. It's all solipsistic. Yeah. But no, it ain't all about you. All these satellites, you're one of my satellites, kid, I'm just like I'm one parent. of yours. You're a good parent. I can tell. I like that. Uh, I can tell you are too. This is this yeah, has been a love fest. I'm telling fest. you, I just think you're amazing, Gary. I'm so happy to meet you and know that there's good people in Iowa holding down the fort. You know, keep the faith back there, and you're gonna move trying. in six months. <laughs> try it. Try it. I'm trying until I move. I hear you. But you know what? No, I hear you. Hey. Well, and then you look at people that live in Florida under DeSantis. I mean, that's like absolutely. You know, you're talking about living in a crazy state that is you know it's yes, not even and, realistic and I, I know i they're they're erasing history no and i know our ilk i know actors going there i know gay people going there for the lifestyle uh the, for the weather and and the ocean and all that but they are surrounded by this matrix now of just uh yeah. antiquated very um, much values so. very much so you know it's the yeah, dark it's ages going backwards it's absolutely terrifying yeah it really is DeSantis scares yeah. me yeah he does Ugh. 
Well, he scares me because he's, he's, he believes in the same things Trump believes in, except he's I actually know. intelligent. I think that his very caustic, narcissistic personality will come out on the stump yeah. if he's out in front of people. He's a mean man. Oh, fuck. I believe that. God. Well, listen, I'm glad you're out there keeping the faith. I'm keeping the faith. You guys you go over there to GaryHasIssues.com. Take a look. It's some really intelligent writing, and it's also very funny. So that's a great resource. I have one other thing to plug, yeah, man. please. I do a little podcast called The Gary and Kenny Show. I'm with Kenny Seisler, oh. who is a – you know Kenny. Yeah. Everybody knows Kenny. Kenny was a director of comedy. We did Comic Strip Live together. I was the host of that in 1990. I don't think I realized that. Yeah. Yeah. And so we have a little show when we'd love to have you on. Um, we do a little show called The Gary and Kenny Show. On, yeah. and we're, we're on YouTube. I like the the visual cool. that we, we do. And we do all the podcast platforms. Yeah. But uh, Gary and Kenny Show. So check that out as well as Gary has cool, issues. Cool, man. Gary and Kenny Show. Excellent. All and right. you are great, by the way. You're one of the finest interviewers ever uh, seriously thanks, Gary. you're great oh, thanks thank you that's so nice of you i wish npr would hear you say that well we'll make <laughs> I them here like I would, they'll make sometimes they're sometimes they're their programming on the weekends is so bad. I can't even believe how bad their flipping programming is. Their cooking shows and oh my yeah. God, it's it's one more painful thing after the other. You can't yes. listen to NPR on the weekends. And I think like this show would be perfect. The every show Saturday is noon. perfect. Are you kidding Thank me? You. you know, what? it's you're just a matter so nice. of time. Matter I of time. So. I hope you. I hope you're right. All right, you guys, we get to wrap it up. I want to thank you again for tuning in to Storyworthy. And don't forget that we're playing Story Smash, the storytelling game show, over in Santa Monica at The Crow on April 7th. It's Friday night, April 7th at 8 o'clock. I've got Blanca Patch, Peter Melman, and Kathy Ladman. So please come on down to Story Smash, the storytelling game show. It's the funniest show in Los Angeles, hands down. It really is. So come on out. April 7th, you can head over to StorySmashShow.com for more information. Or, of course, at StoryWorthyPodcast.com. We've got information there as well. All right, you guys. One more time on behalf of the very talented Gary Kroger. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Christine Blackburn saying, make it a story worthy week. Thanks for joining us on the Story Worthy Podcast. We'll be back next week with all new stories. Subscribe to Story Worthy on iTunes and visit the Story Worthy website at storyworthypodcast.com. Hey, hey.